Welcome everyone. We'll be just waiting a few more minutes to let everybody uh, that's trying to sign in log in and then we'll be getting underway. So thank you for your patience. Um, hang on just a moment or two. Welcome everyone. Uh, we are here from the ESA to talk to you about the transforming ESA awards, how to nominate and uh, the excellence. I'm Anil Kumar Gowda. I work at Bayer Crop Science. I personally do not have much experience working on awards or receiving awards from ESA, but I do have received awards from other um, organizations such as Society for Invertebrate Pathology, and have experience in in, in uh, nominating individuals for awards at Beltway Cotton Conferences and others. With that, I'll turn it over to Susan. Oh, before I say I get going there, uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the ESA website afterwards. Following the formal uh, uh, presentation, we will have the Q and A session. But if you have any question throughout the presentation feel free, uh, free to enter them in the chat box so we can take a look at them and uh, read them out to the proper panelists to answer them. And the, also, it, there will be opportunity to add more questions towards the end of the presentation as well. With that, over to you, Susan. Thank you, Anil. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Susan Weller, past president of the Entomological Society and a 2020 ESA fellow. I really wish, I'm really excited that you've joined us for our webinar on how to nominate excellence. The purpose of this webinar is to encourage the nomination and recognition of diverse candidates. We want the recipients of our society's awards and honors to reflect the diversity of our membership. Next slide, please. Our canvassing committee is charged by President Michelle Smith uh, to accomplish three things this year. First, to educate ESA membership about the nomination process. Two, uh, we will engage stakeholders within the society to encourage nominations. And three, coordinate our efforts with other ESA committees and ESA leadership. Today's webinar is part of our efforts to educate. If you have any unanswered questions after today, please reach out to me or another member of this committee. And here on this second slide, you can see uh, the members of the committee, uh, our affiliation, and um, we, uh, again, we all welcome uh, you contacting us with, with questions and clarifications. Uh, next slide, please. Let's start with the why. Why should I nominate someone or self-nominate for an ESA award? Well, first and foremost, having the recognition by your peers furthers your career and the careers of others. It, it opens doors to new opportunities and new connections for your research, your teaching, and your public engagement and extension. It is also evidence to support promotion within your organization. Second, the awards and honors can also lead to other types of recognition, more awards and honors, and leadership opportunities. And finally, your organization, be it a business, department, or university, also benefits from your recognition. And they'll happily tweet about your success, believe me. And 
some administrators will even take the time to send you a note of congratulations. I was thrilled to receive a handwritten note from my university chancellor last fall. So next slide, please. Now we understand why we should nominate people and, and self-nominate, let's get on to what's available. And I have a question for you. Do you know how many awards and honors are offered by ESA? Let's do a poll. Go ahead, choose one, select a number. And I don't get to vote because I know the answer. Okay, I can't see the progress, so I'm assuming Willett will share it when we have. Ah, thank you. Okay, so the correct answer is, drum roll please, 95. So 22% of you got it right. So that's, that's great and it's it surprised me when I found out the answer. Um, so back to the slides. Um, because there are so many awards and honors available through our society, it is important to find the right match for the person you are nominating or for yourself. And during the rest of this presentation, um, the panelists will be providing some guidance on uh, how to select awards and honors. And I also encourage you to visit with one of us or ESA staff, Cindy Myers, if you have questions about matching a specific award to someone's talents. So next, I'm going to ask Tracy and Sylvia to uh, pop in and talk about myths surrounding the awards nomination process. Over to you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, hi, I'm Tracy Lesky. I'm a research entomologist and station director at the Appalachian Fruit Research Station, part of USDA ARS. And like my colleagues on this um, webinar, I too have been able to, you know, I've received some awards like the Comstock Award and the L.O. Howard from the Eastern Branch. And I've also had a lot of experience and success in nominating other graduate students, postdocs, or colleagues for these awards. And so I just too want to emphasize that I hope you will take the opportunity to participate in the awards process for yourself and your colleagues. So now the next thing we want to do before we get into some more specifics is just go ahead and bust any myths that may be out there regarding the awards process. We really don't want anything to hold you back from nominating yourself or your colleagues. So below are a number of myths and we'll just talk about them as what they are, which is not true. The first one, you have to be nominated by an existing fellow to win an ESA fellow. That is a myth, that is not true. You absolutely do not have to be nominated by an existing fellow. Instead, and you're going to hear more about this as we move forward, you should have folks write letters of support who really know you and can speak to your accomplishments. Okay. How about myth number two? You are automatically resubmitted as a candidate if you aren't selected. Not true. <laughs> you can resubmit a package if you aren't selected and you don't win, but the package is not automatically resubmitted. You need to um, do that e either you or your nom the person who nominated you. And remember, just check the website again to make sure any guidelines haven't been updated. That's critical too. And then finally, myth number three for me, you have to have won a more junior award to be eligible for more a more senior award. Again, this is absolutely a myth. This is not true. Awards are based on merit of the application. So whether it's a junior award, a senior award, a fellow, a branch award, whatever it is, read the description. And if it applies to the person you're nominating or you as the nominee, nominee just go for it. So again, those are the three myths I'll present, but I wanna turn it over to Sylvia who will talk about the others. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you my experience. I'm Sylvia Rondon. I am a professor and extension entomology specialist with Oregon State University. I have nominated and also supported several colleagues from several institutions. I have been nominated and won several awards, including the 2019 Excellent in IPM. 
With that, I will continue with the following myths. Myth number four, only land-grant institutions win awards. That's not true. Uh, I was not able to collect all the data for today's presentation, but I promise I will do that. But several, there are several winners of institutions like from small colleges, USDA, et cetera. In my experience and my observation is that the key is to establish award committees to push for nominations. There are plenty of uh, people around that can successfully get any of the awards that ESE, ESA prepares. Myth number five, cell nominations are embarrassing. That's a completely, that's something completely not true. Uh, you know, if you are shy about nominating yourself, just think it, think about your program. Uh, when your name is out there, this is a very good PR, not only for yourself, but think about your program, your unit, and your institution. And as Susan said at the beginning, your institution will be very happy to tweet, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, about your accomplishments. So do it for your unit and institution. Myth number six, nominees shouldn't be aware of ongoing nomination. Uh, we feel that uh, if the nominee is aware of the ongoing nomination, it will straighten the package and you, the uh, chances of success will be higher. And the last of my topics here is regarding uh, the thinking about that you are not qualified. And I have been listening a lot about this famous imposter syndrome, and we will talk about that in the next slide. However, I, I just wanted to share with you my personal opinion. Don't underestimate your own accomplishments on, and sense of worth. I think nobody has the right to make you feel less or unworthy. You are a valuable and a strong person of our scientific community, and your presence, your contributions are going to make our society stronger. So don't be shy, believe in yourself, and please apply to our ESA awards. With that, the next slide, please. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, up next, we have um, Dr. Lauren Diepenbrock, who is an assistant professor at the University of Florida. Uh, she was highlighted in an Entomology Today article for overcoming her own imposter syndrome and putting herself forward for ESA awards. She's won many awards, um, including the ECP Extension Award, and has served on a variety of awards-related committees. She'll be talking to us today about her own experience in overcoming um, imposter syndrome. Thanks, Rob. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Lauren Diepenbrock, as, Lord said, or as Rob said. I am down at the University of Florida at the Citrus Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred. I'm an extension specialist and assistant professor in entomology. Um, you know, I didn't actually know what this thing called um, imposter syndrome was as a grad student. I knew I had a lot of self-doubt, and I saw all my classmates and all these amazing scientists, and <clears throat> thought it was super cool that they actually talked to me, a lowly graduate student. But it, <clears throat> my apologies, allergies are really bad in Florida right now. Um, I also realized that they had to be in my position at some point in time. And I think we all have that moment as grad students, as postdocs, as career researchers, where we have doubt in our abilities. But, you know, when you start looking at these awards, you realize all the things you have done, and that's pretty darn cool. If, if nothing else, when you put it together, that that package, you see a lot of work. It's really neat. And I do think, I like whoever made this list, it's beautiful. This is so many of us on here, the perfectionist, the super person, the natural genius, the soloist, which we don't really do science in a bubble as much as they used to, but it still happens. Um, and the expert, this one gets me a lot because I'm supposed to know it all, and I definitely don't. Um, but I think that uh, one of the great things that I have learned in order to apply for these awards is to not think about it as a nomination when you're putting yourself out there, think of it as an application. If you take that mentality, then you know it kind of takes a little bit of that pressure of feeling like you're trying to brag off of yourself. You're qualified. If you meet those requirements, you are completely qualified to receive that award. Therefore, you shouldn't feel bad about putting together your own application and asking for references just like you would for a job application. Um, back when I was applying for um, awards in graduate school, I was trying to make myself stand out because I knew the job market was not great when I was finishing up. 
and I saw the North Central Branch Graduate Student Award as an opportunity. And in all honesty, I applied for that and the Comstock Award in the same application setting. Um, and I did not get the Comstock, obviously. Somebody who was more qualified than I was at the time, he received it and he was a very great candidate. And I was nervous knowing I was going against this person that I had looked up to for some of the work he did. But I was really happy to get the award that I did receive. And then as a postdoc, is when they started the uh, early career awards and I saw that extension award and I was like, well, I need all those requirements, so why not? And I just I went for it and it was pretty cool because I got it and I've seen several of my colleagues receive it afterwards and it's a nice recognition and I think it's really great. Um, the other thing I also wanted to say while I'm on here is to consider not just yourself, but what you, what you can submit other people for. I was very happy to sponsor a nomination for my former PI uh, for the Southeast Branch Excellent in IPM Award, um, and she did receive it last past year, so that was very exciting for us. And um, the other cool thing that can really come from these um, award submissions is that you might get an opportunity that you didn't know existed. And case in point is, as a postdoc, I saw the Science Policy Fellowship and it looked awesome. It looked like something I'd really love to do. So I put my application in, absolutely did not even get an interview, was not really considered beyond the initial application. But a few weeks afterwards, I received a phone call from my, the president of the Southeast branch where I was a postdoc, and she invited me to serve as the representative for the Southeast branch for the Science Policy Committee. And I have been serving on that committee since 2016, and it has been an amazing experience. So these awards do more than just getting a piece of paper or a cool plaque, but you can get some really great opportunities to meet and interact with people just by putting in these applications so people know you're interested. And I believe the next slide is actually about nominating yourself, which I talked a little bit about, but Meredith Spence Bolio is going to give you more information about submitting a self-nomination. Great, thanks Lauren. Uh, so as she said, I'm Meredith Spence Bolio. I'm currently the Assistant Director of the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine at Duke University. Um, but I was recently a student at NC State and I'm on this committee as the Student Affairs Committee Rep. Um, so like Lauren said, consider nominating yourself for these awards. I'm a big advocate of self-nomination. I've nominated myself for many awards and opportunities, both within ESA and with other, within other academic societies, and have been successful in receiving the MOVE Student Travel Award and, uh, and the Science Policy Fellows this year. Um, so do consider self-nomination. This can be particularly important if you are not part of a major entomology department or if you're an in an underrepresented sector. So essentially, if you're not around entomologists in your work environment every day, or you're not around people that are ESA members, they obviously won't know about these awards and won't know to put your name forward. So it can be really important to nominate yourself in those situations. But even if you are part of a major entomology department, I would still strongly encourage you to consider nominating yourself because you are your best advocate. You best know the breadth and depth of your experiences that make you qualify for the award, and you are the person that can best articulate why you are the top candidate and should be selected for that award. Uh, so speaking about self-nomination, I wanted to quickly uh, pull up a poll. We have one more poll question for you. So this is what percent of nominations last year were self-nominations and what percent of the winner winners were self-nominations? So we'll give everybody a second to select their choices. All right, how are we doing on those poll results? I'm gonna share them right now. Perfect. All right, so most of you thought 25% self-nominations and 40% self-nomination uh, self winners. So the correct answer is actually 15 and 10. So 15% of the nominations last year were self-nominations and 10% uh, of the winners were self-nominations. So this could be a little bit of that imposter syndrome uh, where people aren't nominating themselves as much as people think they are. Um, 
But something you'll note from those numbers is that they're about the same percentages. So you can tell that there's not a disadvantage to self nominations. And this holds true for even the most prestigious awards in the society. Uh, if you were able to attend the annual meeting last November, you probably caught the Founders Memorial Lecture by Michelle Samuel Fu, and she talked about uh, winning the Founders Memorial Prize as a self-nomination. Uh, so regardless of whether you're going to be self-nominating or nominating someone else, the best thing you can do is familiarize yourself with the awards that the society offers and the eligibility criteria for these awards. Like Susan mentioned, we offer a lot of awards, and these are at the society level, branch level, and within the sections. Um, but there's a handy awards eligibility grid linked here that has uh, the society level awards and all of their uh, eligibility criteria, requirements, deadlines, and whether you have to be nominated by a branch or whether anyone can nominate. So that's a really handy chart that you should check out. Um, most of the awards that the society offers, anyone can nominate for, but there are a few that do have to come from the branch. Um, some exceptions that need to be coming from the branch are the Distinguished Achievement Awards and Extension in Teaching um, and the Comstock Award for graduate students. Uh, now, clearly the nomination criteria are going to vary by the award uh, because they're all looking for specific things. Uh, but they're all going to generally require a nomination letter describing why the person's qualified and should be selected for the award, a CV highlighting uh, recent publications, awards, and other qualifications, and some letters of recommendation. Uh, the student and the early career professional awards tend to also require a statement from the candidate as part of the application package. So with all of these, you want to make sure that you have all of the pieces that are required in the nomination package, and you want to make sure that you're reading all of the, the fine print. Make sure you're following the page limits, any file format specifications, and paying attention to how these nominations are supposed to be submitted, um, and make sure you're following all of those things. You don't want your nomination to have a reason to be disqualified from the start because it was over a page limit, say. Now, with any of these awards, whether you're self-nominating or nominating someone else, you do want to get started on these nominations uh, well in advance of the deadline because you want to give the candidate and the recommendation writers time to really tailor um, their components of the application packet for the particular award. For example, the CVs a lot of times have a two-page limit and only allow you to highlight five recent publications or five recent outreach materials. So you really want to give everybody time to think critically about what within their um, extensive CV that they'd most like to highlight that'll make them the best candidate for the award that they're going up for. And this is true for nomination writers as well, which you can really help out by sending them a CV with some highlighted items that you'd like for them to cover in their recommendation letter. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Alma Solis to talk a little bit more about best practices for nomination writers. And Alma, if you're talking right now, I believe you're still on mute. Okay. Hi, I'm Alma Solis. I'm a research entomologist with the Systematic Entomology Lab with ARS USDA. I'm a past ESA fellow, and at the time I worked with a nominator to develop a package. Last year, I nominated a student each for the ESA ECP and the Student Activity Awards and wrote two letters of recommendation for ESA Fellow. One of the most important things is to know the nominee uh, if you're nominating someone. If you are nominating yourself, the letter should be from someone who knows you, knows about your accomplishments relative to the award, and someone who will write an enthusiastic letter for you. And uh, I think that it should be a high impact letter. And there are many ways to write high impact letters, but this is how I write them. For the first paragraph, I'd like to use a hook or a personal story exemplifying the qualification of the nominee for the award. Each paragraph or topic should start with a summary and or laudatory statement. Summarize each topic with impact. Do not list accomplishments as in the CV. 
The last paragraph should restate the above in a novel manner from the perspective of the nominator and why the nominee is the best candidate for the award. The letter should be one page or just over, avoid really long letters. And finally, uh, avoid gender and under and other biased language. Uh, you can use the gender bias calculator and here's the uh, site where you can go to find that. Um, the nomination letters are really important and they should be well written. So choose your uh, letter writers carefully. And I would say ask for more letters than you need so that you can choose the best ones to include in your package. Um, so if you want to learn more about writing letters, how letters are look and are written uh, in nomination, uh, it's a, you should get involved in awards committees. And I think the next speaker, next slide, we'll talk about this. Thanks, Alma. Um, I'm Rob Morrison. I'm a research entomologist with the USDA ARS Center for Grain and Animal Health Research in Manhattan, Kansas. And I've personally um, served on uh, several uh, judging panels for awards, as well as awards task forces for um, ESA. I've nominated my own staff for uh, awards successfully from ESA, and I've also uh, been the recipient um, for several ESA awards, including the Henry and Sylvia Richardson grant, um, as well as uh, uh, branch uh, excellence in early career awards. Um, and so I can't, you know, in my own career, I served early um, and often on these judging panels, and I um, really can't communicate how important it is to have that experience um, in order to um, know what is uh, award winning uh, application, what that looks like. And so a majority of these panels include representatives, you know, from each section in the society, each branch. Um, they'll include people from academia, industry, and government, but they may not be in your particular specialty. And so you need to keep that in mind when crafting your documents. You want to write it to a kind of an educated lay audience, um, use a, you know, kind of verbiage that will be understood by um, a lot of people and not just people in the particular area you're working in. Um, so again, the you know, serving on these committees will allow you to get experience seeing what, what award-winning packets look like. Um, if you're interested in serving, you can reach out to your sanction or branch representative on the awards and honors committee, um, or another good place to reach out is to your branch or section leadership to see if there's any um, openings on uh, committees that you could serve on. Um, and uh, again, you know, these are similar to grant review panels, and so you kind of understand kind of how the flow is and, and what really it's gripping um, as you're reviewing these. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so, you know, that brings us, uh, you know, to back to the awards, you know, even if you don't um, uh, win an award, you know, there is still a worth in putting yourself or others forward um, uh, through the process. And so I always tell my students, you know, you always uh, miss the awards that you don't apply for. And really you don't know if you're gonna get the award until you go through the process. And so that's, that's kind of central. Um, but beyond that, um, they're putting together a packet will allow you to see what criteria, what are these awards looking for? Um, you will be able to compare against your own CV and experiences what areas might uh, be a little bit lacking on your part. Um, how can you improve for the future that kind of can help you strategize to um, uh, determine where you want to put your effort going forward um, to make yourself a more suitable candidate. Um, you also develop a better relationship with the individual um, uh, that is nominating you or who you're nominating. Um, and, and coordinating this, and so that's that's a value to your career. Um, again, uh, you know, recognizing those skills which you don't currently have, but which um, you can get in the future, and taking steps to get those. Um, and as was mentioned um, prior, you know, you increase your name recognition within the community when you put yourself forward for these awards, and so. 
um, you know, and, and in ways that are sometimes unpredictable. So, you know, you may put yourself forward, you may not get it, um, but then afterwards, as uh, one, one person, uh, I think Dr. Diefenbrock mentioned, uh, she ended up getting offered a position on the, the uh, policy committee. Um, so uh, you never know kind of where uh, these connections will go. Um, and then for those that are nominating, especially early career, folks getting their labs up and going that also gets your name out there as a nominator and someone who cares about their staff and, um, you know, works with, um, you know, a great a cohort of people. So uh, there's benefits all around even if it doesn't pan out. Um, all right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trace, uh, Dr. Lesky, who will talk a little bit more about the fellows. Thank you, Rob. Um, so, uh, what we're going to talk about now is just some of the changes that have occurred with the award application for ESA fellows this year. And these were changes that were approved by the governing board last week. And just to sort of emphasize that the governing board has been working to ensure we receive nominations across the broadest um, cross-section of our membership to represent both the professional and societal diversity that exists within e ESA. And so toward that end, um, the first change that um, I just wanted to mention is that we will have applicants will need to be nominated in a single area that really represents that area or category uh, where they've had the greatest achievement and impact. And so um, this is a change from past years as folks may have tried to nominate people across areas or categories, but this hasn't provided the best approach to showcasing the strengths of the candidate. There's a kind of a false assumption you need to excel in all areas, as well as the complexity for evaluation. Um, so we now have existing categories, which have included um, research, teaching, extension, administration, and military, but we have a new category, public engagement and science policy has been added. And again, remember, we're trying to ensure that we really capture the kind of professional careers that our membership um, undertakes. Um, so that's that that I wanted to just make sure was clear. Also, we've been standardizing the format for the application with page limits for support letters and CVs. We've increased the nomination letter to three pages maximum. Um, We've removed the list of nomination supporters. This was something that was in previous, um, and would, we would see in some previous packets, but that's no longer going to be part of the packet. And again, we've added a bio sketch that highlights the nominee's most impactful contributions. And the bottom line is with these areas, we really do want to um, highlight those areas where people have had the, the biggest impacts. Now, sometimes people think, oh, this is kind of an end of career award. Um, no, that's not true. This could happen earlier in someone's career. Again, it's all about impact in those categories. Um, the new submission site will be streamlined for the submission process and it will sort of prompt the person putting in the nomination packet to ensure all those pieces are in there. So hopefully all of these changes we think will be really helpful and um, hopefully even increase the number of fellow nominees that we have going forward. So I think that's all I have on this slide. I, Susan, I believe I turn it back to you. Uh, thank you, Tracy. I think we all turn on our webcams and Anil has graciously offered to um, uh, host our Q&A with our attendees. So again, um, if you are, um, we have, uh, quite a few people online. If you have a question, please put it in the um, chat box and it will make its way to us. Um, yeah, we, we do have one from Bryony Bonding. Um, it's about the feedback on unsuccessful nominations, provide valuable information for both our committees and nominees. Would ESA please consider providing feedback to nominees on request in the future? I think that's above my um, pay grade, even though that was the topic that I, I talked about. <laughs> um, well, to be, I, I don't want to dodge 
um, the question. What I would say is that this is a perennial request that comes before the committees that make these decisions. And to date, the policy has been not to give specific feedback. Um, but again, we can we can transmit this question to the committee in charge and ask them um, again to to think about whether general um, general feedback could be provided. So, um, does anyone else wish to comment on this com uh, question? I want to say something, but before we go there, let me just uh, remind our audience here so they can uh, continue to post questions in the Q and A chat box. Uh, one thing we, we, we talked about uh, uh, during our preparation, Susan, was even though there may not be a currently mechanism to get the feedback from the awards committee, but this, uh, our committee would be happy to take a look at the application packets and offer suggestions or feedback to anyone who wants to uh, take advantage of it, right? Uh, yeah, and the, the other thing I'll say about this subject is that, um, you know, at, at, as someone who's n nominated people for and also been nominated for awards, it's always instructive if you don't win the award to see who was the award winner um, and, and maybe, you know, uh, either if they have their CV somewhere public or you could request their CV and just kind of see uh, you know, what did the award winner look like? What were their qualifications? And like, how can you get to that uh, same level in asking those types of questions? So you can do a little background research yourself to, to help figure out some of that stuff. Yes, we have another question from Kelly Hoover. Question is, is it true that ESA fellow nominations, it's best to have ESA fellows write support letters? I'll take that one. Uh, Kelly, uh, no, we, we that was one of the myths we've been talking about, but it's out there that people think that the, the support letters should come from people who are already fellows of the society. And what we're trying to tell everybody, no, that is not the case. They do not need to be written by fellows. What they need to, or whom they need to be written by, are people who can speak to the nominee's accomplishments. It may be, you know, someone who is working with someone in a department or perhaps a mentee or others, but really, it, those letters should come from people who can support the impacts that are going to be articulated in the bio sketch and CV, that sort of thing. So, but definitely it's not, it's not required. Okay, another question here. What, what advice does the panel have for being strategic about your package? Any individual best practices? Well, I can speak to my personal experience. Um, I applied for the um, ESA Student Activity Award um, last year, a couple years back recently. Um, and that award really emphasizes uh, academic achievement, but also involvement with the society and involvement with um, your university and your community as well. Um, so with that award, I tried to select uh, letters of recommendation writers that could speak to different aspects of that. So that was a way that I that I strategized. I had um, obviously my advisor write a recommendation letter who could really speak to my academic and um, research achievements. But then I actually had a peer that I worked with um, in the uh, student government and the graduate student association that could speak to my involvement with the campus community and the uh, impact I've done through my student activities. I wasn't successful in that award um, because there was an outstanding candidate the same year that I applied, but I think that can be a really good strategy is just thinking about what are the diverse things that the award requires and seeing if you have people that can speak to different aspects of those requirements. To add to what Meredith said, um, and I, I kind of used the strategy when I applied for jobs too, and. Uh, 50, 50 shot on the interviews. Um, I really looked at what the call was and what are they looking for in that call? And those are the order it came up in the call for the award and for job applications. That's exactly how I put it in my application package. You're, you're tight on space, so some things will have to get cut. And you may have done amazing work in one area, but it may not be 
what they're looking for. So you really want to highlight exactly what they want to see. Make it easy. Make it so easy for them to say yes that your your odds are better than anybody else out there. And I would just chime in. It's something we haven't yet really explicitly addressed, but a an excellent nomination package just takes time. It's like writing a manuscript or a grant proposal. You need to do drafts, and uh, especially if you're providing your bio sketch to your nominator or create, or you are the nominator, um, you just need time to pull together a high quality packet. And so look at the deadline and work back, knowing what your busy schedule looks like and knowing that the other support letters are coming from equally busy people. You really can't start the process too early. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add, like, a great mentor once told me, you know, when applying for grants, like, everything that they want to hear is in the award criteria. So look at those criteria, pour over them, what are the words they use, like, show them how you most uh, ideally fit what they are looking for. We have a question from Thomas Sparks. It's an interesting one. Any candidate nominated but not selected may be renominated re no more than two times within two year period. After is her, her initial submission. What exactly does that mean? Do you the question? Do I need to re read it? Yes, if you could read it one more time, Anil, I, I got lost yeah. in the... Yep. Any candidate nominated but not selected for the award within two years of period from the time they've initially applied, what does that mean? It basically, I mean, it means exactly what it says, is that it got put in once and you can basically submit it two more times. So um, case in point, I nominated somebody for an award one year and it didn't happen. and we decided to go ahead and rework that draft. And I worked with the person I was nominating and as well as one of their letter writers, and we resubmitted it again. Because really, I mean, if somebody's qualified, odds are there's multiple qualified people applying that year. And you're gonna have similar people on the committee year to year. They're gonna know you applied before. And if you're cream of the crop, all, the, all things equal, and you've applied before, I think it could bump you ahead. And I've been on other committees, not with ESA, where that has actually been the case, where somebody's applied twice for something and every single time it's been against really excellent competitors because that's just what you're going to get. We're all scientists. We all work really hard and try to be the best. Um, you just got to keep trying for some of these things. Like if you know you deserve that award, you just got to keep going at it. Sorry. And you mentioned something important. It's not, uh, maybe some people misunderstand that automatically the package is going to move forward for the following year when you actually have the chance to improve the package, make it stronger, and resubmit it for the following year. That's that. I think that's where the confusion comes. Uh, so you apply, you don't get it, get work on the package, improve it, and send it out. You have two more chances to resubmit that package. And I believe this is true for some awards, but not all. So you have to go to the ESA website to check which of those awards do qualify for this specific topic of discussion. And just to emphasize what Sylvia said, it does have to be resubmitted. Um, rework it, absolutely, make it stronger, but it does need to be officially resubmitted. We have another question. Can support letters come from people in your own department or organization that you know best? Yes. Yeah, predominantly everybody is not in their head. <laughs> yes. Um, again, this gets to strategy. If all the letters are from your department or your university, then the question becomes if if it's to be a national honor how well are you known beyond your university so again strategically you want people who know you well and this also applies i would say in government positions and um, uh, businesses that how are you known through your networks and again if you don't have strong letter writers from a diversity don't go there 
because uh, it's important that it's a strong letter first, but then you might want to question whether this is the year you want to put your application forward if you don't have strong letter writers from outside. So you do need them from within, but you also it's beneficial to have them from outside. And I think that's also a little dependent on which award you're going for. Like if you're going for a student award, your contacts might be a little smaller because you're earlier in your career stage. So um, I think it it can vary based on the award as well. But with any of the awards, you want them to be strong nomination letters from people that know you well and can speak to your accomplishments. Yeah, excellent point, Meredith. It it really is dependent on career stage. Well, I'm going to um, encourage our audience to ask more questions. We have another 10, 15 minutes to go. So in the meantime, uh, just for the panelists back, do any of you have some best practices from your own experience that have not, that have not been covered so far? And have not been what? Not been covered or discussed today. So one of the things that I was taught to do during my PhD was to get my stuff together really early and send my packet in its totality, along with the award description to my letter writers with plenty of time to write their letter. That way they could actually mold their letter to support the things that I wanted to be highlighted. And I think it worked pretty good. Yeah, yeah I, I would say... I was gonna say. Oh, sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, go ahead, Meredith, sorry. Okay, I was just gonna add on, um, I was gonna say the same thing. I think that's a great best practice is sending the, the packet uh, to your recommendation writers as you plan to submit it uh, so that they can see exactly what you're highlighting about yourself. And then I usually take it a step further and send them um, a copy of my full CV um, so that they know the breadth of what I've been up to and highlight things that I think that it would be great for them to write about. So if I did a, a outreach poster at a large outreach event, and this is an outreach award, like flag that, say, please mention this. Um, that's a great best practice. Yeah, one, one thing I could pos possibly add here is once I was making a nomination for somebody and then I knew that I was running out of time. So I, I worked with my colleague, we kind of co-nominated, but at least that helped, helped us out to kind of split up the workload and, and still put, up, put across a good, good, good package. And I'll just add, you know, you may want to get on the ESA website and become familiar with just using the, you know, the portal to put all of your things in. You don't want to wait till the last day to say, okay, how do I put all of these pieces in? Make sure you give yourself a little time to do that electronic part of the process too. And I also like when people follow the templates. Uh, you know, sometimes you think, somebody already mentioned about thinking about your nomination package as a manuscript. It has to follow the rules, right? Make it simpler for the reviewers to find information that uh, they are supposed to find. Don't make it too complicated. Make it simple and easy to follow. And I think that catches more the attention of the reviewers rather than the reviewers trying to find what they're supposed to be find in a complicated package. Simplicity and organization, I think, is key. The, the other thing I, I would mention is that, um, you know, instead of like waiting just until you apply for a job or you apply for an award, um, update your CV regularly or else it's going to be almost an insurmountable challenge. Um, if you just keep up with it as you go, um, you'll always be ready for whatever comes up. And sometimes you never know what's going to happen. You may be asked for your CV for you know, for an impromptu thing you didn't even know was happening. So um, that's my recommendation as well. Mm -hmm. So we have another good question here. What, what are your best strategies for coping with imposter syndrome? I don't think that there is really a strut. Sorry, Mary. Ma ma I don't think there's really a strategy besides working on yourself and your self-confidence. And I would like to suggest to the group that you know, we have been talking so much about this that maybe uh, a whole session just about this, it's kind of warrant in the future. 
Uh, honestly, I, my background, my cultural background is different than most of you in the group. And I have never heard this concept until even more often recently. So uh, it was not in my mind that this is something that I may have been going through. Uh, but the more I hear, the more I learn to have more of a self uh, understanding of what if I have felt that way before. But you know, it's working a lot in your self confidence and your strength as a scientist, and you know, professionally and personally. I agree, Sylvia. It's very good. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the biggest hump to get over is the first award you apply for, um, because you have to convince yourself that you're qualified and ready to apply for that award. But also, it's a lot of work putting together the first award packet that you do. Um, but once you get past that first hump, like you want to make sure you're tailoring your applications to the specifications of each award, but it's easier to do that once you already have something generally put together, especially thinking about student awards. A lot of the student awards between societies have pretty similar requirements, so it can be easy to um, quickly tailor packages. Um, and I really like Lauren's strategy of viewing it as an application rather than a nomination, so it's a little bit it seems like lower of a bar to get over. You just look at the minimum requirements list and if you're qualified, go for it, why not? Um, and then the more you apply for, the more you'll receive. Um, and then it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, just because awards beget more awards and it's also a confidence boost when you get the awards. So just really getting over that initial hump is the challenge. And I'll just jump in because I think Lauren, in one of our discussions prior to this webinar, and we probably mentioned it, but seeing and viewing, you know, winning award packets, if you have the opportunity to get one from somebody and you look at it and you say, hey, I've done some a kind of a similar scale where I am in my career. And that, that also can help sort of, you know, tamp down that imposter syndrome. And I'll also say um, that um you know don't be intimidated by looking at other people's stuff with like a long list of awards because if they were to put like all the awards they've applied for it's probably like two or three times the length of that list so um you know uh, you just have to keep putting yourself back out there and even if you don't win any specific award it doesn't mean you're not you're not doing good work or whatever you know so yeah and if someone approaches you and says hey i want to nominate you for this award say yes please i mean we we come to you know we, because that person thinks you're terrific and so let them help you all, all, all good points and i know sylvia started talking about this um just what's next for this committee and what what have you accomplished since it's being initiated since last year have we accomplished since we yeah, i'm sorry it's a two-part question sorry i think there is some feedback i don't know from where okay it's a two-part question uh, oops sorry so, so you will be able to take a look at the question you have I mean, a lot of feedback I on the end of the um yeah that was sorry that was coming from alma so alma i i did just mute you um uh, apologies. Okay, let me see. Uh, is is it better now? That's good. Um, so um, the question is, what is next for this committee um, for the rest of the year? And then also the second part is, what have you accomplished since initiation of this committee last year? Okay. Um, so let me start with what we managed to accomplish last year, um, because we got constituted. Um, in I think it was February of 2020. And so we had to move very quickly to put together some webinars to educate people um, about the nomination process. And we were really focused on nominations, increasing the pool of nominations. And uh, we did an initial attempt to engage other stakeholders. Um, I think we can do, we can expand those efforts because we have more time going into this year to plan. Um, and uh, so by engaging others, uh, 
we wrote letters to organizations and to small colleges encouraging them to to nominate uh, worthy candidates for our awards but really that's not a personal enough touch there needs we need to be picking up the phone need to be making those personal contacts so that's going to be something moving forward that we'll be working on um, the liaison aspect with other committees because as you saw in our uh, the slide with all the committee members, many people on, on this committee sit on uh, at least one other committee, and so they're helping get the information, get feedback from other parts of the society. So um, our, our goal is to increase the number of nominations and the diversity of the candidates, um, and we did track metrics, and I know we reported them to the governing board, and I don't have them at the tip of my tongue, but we did increase the number of nominations, so um, we'd like to continue to do that. We aspire to do more in 2021. And if I can add, you know, there is a number of ESA members and non-members attending this seminar right now, and as Susan said, we are right now through this webinar educating others about awards, and we are hoping that all of you attending, that you multiply that effort in your own institutions. Uh, I think this is the idea of this sort of train the trainers, right? And uh, we cannot do all, just this small group, but through you, I think we can reach out more people. So help us. <laughs> Well said, Sylvia. It's, it can't rest only on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have read out all of the questions. Just looking at the time, we have three, four minutes left. Any any thoughts from people that uh, you want to say as we uh, prepare to wrap up? I think on behalf of the committee, I just would like to thank everyone who joined us today. And again, as Sylvia mentioned, if you would make um, your experience known to others in your network and point them towards the recording of this webinar if they have questions. And again, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Um, and uh, Cindy Myers, the, the ESA staff person, um, is also very responsive and uh, would be delighted to help uh, guide you in in whatever questions you have. So um, please don't hesitate uh, to ask. So with that, I think I'd like to thank all our panelists today, Meredith, Rob, Sylvia, Laura, uh, Anil, uh, Neil, R Tracy, and Alma. And uh, I'd also like to thank ESA staff, Aaron and Willett and Cindy for supporting us in these efforts. And so with that, Thank you all. We'll see you soon. Thank you all.